Good evening. I'm Charles Whitaker, Dean of Medill, and I'd like to welcome you to the 2021 presentation of the John Bartlow Martin Award. The Bartlow Martin Award is one of Medill's highest honors. It's our way of recognizing compelling journalism that raises awareness of issues that are or should be of tremendous public concern. The award is named for a distinguished journalist and longtime Medill faculty member who I happen to have had the great honor of having as a magazine writing instructor when I was an undergraduate at Medill many, many, many years ago. What John Bartlow Martin impressed upon me and all of his charges was the importance of journalism that illuminates the human condition, particularly the pain and suffering of the disenfranchised and dispossessed. He encouraged us not only to write about politics and policies, but to write about the effects that those policies had on people whose voices were rarely heard in the national discourse. We're pleased to present this year's John Bartlow Martin Award to Katie Engelhart for a piece entitled What Happened in Room 10 that appeared in the recently departed California Sunday Magazine. Katie's story is a moving account of the devastating effects of the COVID-19 crisis on nursing homes. It's an incredibly gripping story, wonderfully written and reported, but what makes it all the more remarkable is the fact that the deep and detailed reporting was done in the midst of the pandemic, which means that a great deal of this work was conducted remotely. Congratulations, Katie. Your work is clearly in the spirit of John Bartlow Martin. Here to discuss the making of that story, among other things, is my colleague, Professor Patty Walter, who directs the judging of the John Bartlow Martin Award. Patty, who like me is also a Medill alumna, holds the Helen Gurley Brown Magazine Chair. She also is a Charles Deering McCormick Distinguished Clinical Professor. She teaches a variety of graduate and undergraduate classes across the Medill curriculum. Prior to joining the Medill faculty, Professor Walter was a senior editor at Self Magazine, managing editor and acting editor of Mother Jones Magazine, and editor in chief of The Neighborhood Works, a nonprofit magazine that covered community organizing and public affairs. Before we turn this evening's proceedings over to Patty and Katie, allow us a moment to show you a brief video that will tell you a bit more about John Bartlow Martin, the man for whom this honor is named. John Bartlow Martin was a master storyteller. His coverage of people suffering from poverty, racism, and mental illness drew national attention to problems in American society. His work was published in major magazines such as Harper's, The Saturday Evening Post, Life, Look, and Esquire. His powerful stories prompted policy changes and inspired other journalists to make a difference with their own reporting. Martin's career was varied. He wrote speeches for candidates like Robert Kennedy, Hubert Humphrey, George McGovern, and Adlai Stevenson. He worked with then FCC Commissioner Newton Minow on the famous Fast Wasteland speech. He also worked on the presidential campaign of John F. Kennedy, who appointed him U.S. Ambassador to the Dominican Republic in 1962. He witnessed the first democratic elections there after decades of dictatorship. Martin was born in 1915 in Hamilton, Ohio, but moved to Indianapolis with his parents four years later. In his autobiography, he described his childhood as unhappy and marked by poverty brought on by the Great Depression. Those experiences developed his sympathy for society's downtrodden. He earned his degree from DePaul University in 1935 while working for the Indianapolis Times newspaper. He moved to Chicago with the proceeds from his first freelance article and launched his career in earnest. Martin established himself in the journalism world with a 1948 Harper's article about a mine explosion in Centralia, Illinois, which killed a hundred people. The article was more than 18,000 words long, the longest Harper's had ever published. It helped lead to changes in federal mine safety rules. Martin was the author of 15 books, including a two-volume biography of Adlai Stevenson, A History of Indiana, and a book about American policy in the Caribbean. Martin taught for 10 years at Medill, teaching and inspiring students. He died in 1987, and Medill established the John Bartlow Martin Award the following year to honor his work and his passion for the power of journalism to improve society.
For those of you who may have questions, you can enter those in the Q&A section uh, of Zoom at the bottom of your screen. And now join me in welcoming Professor Walter. Patty. Hello, everyone. Before I introduce this year's winner, I want to note that for the past six years, the majority of our John Bartlow Martin Award winners and honorable mentions come from nonprofit journalism institutes. This year's winner was published in California Sunday Magazine, which is not a nonprofit, but was committed to running similarly immersive, comprehensive, world-changing stories. And I'm using the past tense because, as you heard, the publication folded this past year. Not trying to bring doom and gloom, but I want to point out that these two facts drive home the necessity and urgency of support for the very expensive work of public interest journalism, and it elevates the role of the Martin family, both their generosity and this annual award, their continued toast to social justice reporting. So many thanks to the Martin family. I know several of you are here with us on Zoom today. As for our winner, once again, we had an incredible array of entries. In some ways, we magazine faculty who judge the awards are the lucky ones. We get a sobering but inspiring tour through the year's best reporting and storytelling. It also takes time, so I want to publicly thank the Medill judges, Doug Foster, Allison Goldman, Mayling Hopgood, Alex Kotlowitz, and Karen Springen, and thank our Blue Ribbon judges, Daniel Cadet, Fernando Diaz, and past JBM winner, Hannah Dreyer. Themes emerge every year, whether it's unfair incarceration, voter suppression, or as with this year's winner and honorable mentions, a window into the U.S. healthcare system. You heard Dean Winokur's description of Katie Englehart's story, and we will talk tonight with her about how she reported and described in astonishingly visual terms, the nursing home in Kirkland. That aspect of the piece alone is riveting and uh, it's just a riveting reporting and writing achievement, but Katie didn't stop there. She wove in the complicated background of the business, regulation, and national politics in nursing homes, and she made us readers care about every bit of it, all 15,000 words of it, uh, I might add. Katie Englehart is a writer based in Toronto, New York, and is a fellow at New America. I'm going to let her walk us through her path in journalism, but the highlights include documentary film work for NBC, foreign correspondent work for Vice News and McLean's in Canada, she just published her first book, The Inevitable Dispatches on the Right to Die, and her work has won a wide range of awards. The piece we're honoring today has not only won the John Bartlow Martin Award, but is a finalist in the features category for the National Magazine Awards and won a 2021 George Polk Award for reporting. Please welcome virtually Katie Englehart. We're so honored to have you here with us today. And Katie, our first question, as I mentioned, is an easy one, but important as a journalism school. Please tell us your path in journalism and given your multi-platform background, I'd love some thoughts about what documentary film has taught you about feature writing. Sure, well, thank you, um, Patty, for the kind introduction and thank you to Metal for hosting me today. Um, such an honor to get this award and, and to be able to speak to your students. Um, I know, I'm sure their number one question is, yes, how did you start in journalism? How did you move through it? Um, my own career path was somewhat circuitous. I didn't start out knowing that I wanted to be a journalist. I studied history as an undergraduate and, um, and also as a graduate school student. But um, I did do an internship in journalism when I was an, uh, an undergrad and worked for the student paper. And that quickly um, became something I felt more passionate about than my uh, vague plans to go to law school, <laughs> which many humanities students probably share with me. Um, and, and so when I finished undergrad, I decided I was going to put kind of longer term thinking on hold and, and try out a job in journalism. I moved back to Toronto where I'm from and took a job at a Canadian magazine called McLean's, which had a year long paid internship program. And I think this was really a defining choice for me when I'm asked, you know, what advice I have for someone starting out. I always think that, you know, being more than 10 years out from undergrad myself, my advice is, is fairly irrelevant. I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> but, um, but the advice I do give is to, to find any job that will let you do real work, even if it means um, working at a, a publication or in a place that you find less exciting or prestigious. Um, it was a, a real, there was a real kind of boom in digital journalism ha happening at that time. And I had a lot of friends taking very glamorous sounding internships at big publications where they were never allowed to have a byline, never allowed to do something substantial. So I was really lucky in that um, 
right after undergrad, I was thrown into the thick of reporting in, in Canada and Toronto. Uh, I moved to the UK for graduate school and briefly thought about going into academia, but again, went back to journalism as a freelancer. So I was freelancing largely for Canadian, but sometimes American publications from London and around Europe. Uh, that led me to a job at Vice News, which was just starting up at the time. I had heard of Vice, but had not heard of Vice News when I, um, when I met some reporters who worked there who told me about this new platform that was being launched. So in 2015, I took that job at Vice and made a pretty, pretty dramatic transition for me into video journalism. This was at a time where allegedly everyone was about to pivot to video where there weren't going to be print newspapers in a few years because there were only going to be videos. And um, it certainly is where the, um, the job opportunities seem to be. So it was a sort of difficult decision for me, but I did decide to, to put writing aside for a little bit and, and work in, in um, a new format for me. Uh, and I continued on at Vice then moved to NBC in New York and again was was largely working in kind of short documentaries so 10 to 15 minute news films and it was around that time that I started writing my book and now I'm back to writing uh, full-time as a freelancer so it's been there's been some movement between I think the types of things I'm covering in Europe it was very much big politics and um kind of global affairs or at least European affairs to, um, you know, to being back in writing and, and to being focused in for the last few years, largely on older adults and healthcare inequality. Uh, but, but that's my path. So, um, so I, I'm sure you might, you know, y'all have follow up questions, but that's the overview. Tell me a little bit about, so I, I think sometimes um, in J school, it feels like there's broadcast writing and there's magazine writing. So I'm curious, or, or script writing and feature writing. And so you're someone who's clearly can go back and forth and has gone back and forth. And I'm curious what, how those two ideas inform one another. Yeah, I think they are very different. Um, and they did require the development of different skill sets. I think writers in particular tend to be a bit more snobby about their own skills. They assume that they could do video if they needed to or do TV if they needed to, and it couldn't possibly be that hard. Um, I think they're both very hard in different ways. Um, I, I, I did do some kind of peer broadcast work, but it was mostly working in this short documentary okay. format, um, which is a very different kind of writing, of course. But I think I was sort of anxious at the time about being pigeonholed, but the idea of giving up a writing career. Um, I wish someone had told me that I could relax, that actually, you know, it's not as common to work in, in a cross medium, but it's, it's possible. Um, and also I, I think I, I didn't realize at the time how much working in video would add back to my writing. So I think I'd, I'd been used to writing sort of almost like Time Magazine type stories that were had, had elements of narrative but weren't particularly narrative. And working in video, in documentary especially, where everything is about scenes, building cohesive scenes that then attach to each other, that really, it was really that that shaped my understanding of kind of how to put together a story narratively. So, and certainly gave me a lot more appreciation for visual detail, which I, didn't, I don't think I have a natural aptitude for, um, but uh, you know, if you have to, to, to focus on it through a camera lens, then, then of course you learn. That's uh, wonderful. I, I, I sort of want to start with how did you find this piece, but the natural pivot from the, your comments there is a question that a lot of students already submitted, which was how did you report in order to build visual scenes remotely. So maybe you can answer yeah. sort of both of those, but I think that that's one of the most, it, it's amazing to hear you say that you don't think you have a natural aptitude for it because this is a vivid, vivid piece. And so Thank hearing you. how you did that in the reporting situation that you had to do in the pandemic. Yeah. Um, is a friend of mine. Yeah, so I reported this story, which is set in 
Kirkland, Washington outside Seattle. I reported it all from Toronto, Canada, where I am right now. Um, and this was not just because I was in Toronto, but, but really by necessity, this was the first few months of the pandemic. I started working on this story in May. So kind of two months after things locked down um, and the nursing home wasn't even letting in family members. There was no way they were gonna let me in. There was no way they should have let me in. Um, so, and, and there was nothing really to be gained on the ground in Washington. So it was one of those rare, because everything was locked down. Mm -hmm. um, so it was one of those rare instances where I didn't feel guilty reporting from afar. Um, but it did require, uh, you know, a lot more work obviously because I, I couldn't be there. So, at the beginning, uh, I was really still looking for what the story was. This is commissioned to be a around a four to five thousand word piece, <laughs> um, so it ended up being, you know, I think more than triple that. But in the beginning, I was really just talking to whoever I could. I talked with dozens of family members, residents, and 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 staff, and I was. Um, my only, my only trick um, when I'm starting out is really to have the conversations be as long and as kind of aimless as I have time for. I think um, I've actually taught myself and trained myself to almost underprepare for a first phone call with someone who's not an expert, but someone who I'm just interested in getting to know as a witness or a, a character. Uh, and I think people what's on their mind, what they're feeling passionate about is probably most interesting anyway. So I started out this reporting by just having a huge, uh, just speaking to whoever I could. And I got names in some cases from local news stories that had been done, um, Facebook posts. At one point, someone I spoke to sent me the email addresses for a lot of other family members um, without asking them, um, which was an enormous help. <laughs> Uh, and so I probably contacted, um, you know, maybe 80 people and I ended up speaking to maybe half of them. Um, and then in terms of building visuals, I was able to come up with a few tricks for this story. So early on, I spent a lot of time looking at, you know, Reuters had sent, the agencies had sent photographers and they'd had a few pictures published, but they'd had hundreds of photos put on their website. I spent a lot of time looking at those photos, watching local news videos. And I was able to also get um, a, an architectural plan for the nursing home. And so as I started speaking to people, I started being able to map out in this nursing home who lived where. Uh, I started asking for room numbers fairly quickly, um, where, where staff worked, what wings they were on and piecing together kind of a visual understanding of, of the setting. And then as I went on, you know, in a lot of cases, I called people back and we had multiple conversations that were a lot more focused. And um, I would ask them for any photos they had. I would ask them for videos they'd taken from before COVID from inside the nursing home and just ask them to describe things for me. I think, um, you know, there's the kind of, cheesy trope about magazine journalists that you know someone tells you this traumatic story and then you stop and you say but what were you wearing and what color was your sweater and you know your, your, those recreation questions but I think just being honest with people and saying you know I can't be there normally I'd be there um, when I'm reporting a story but I can't do you remember what things looked like can you describe the room um, linger really lingering on if a moment seems important spending time on it do you remember what she said? Um, what do you think she would have been wearing? You know, what do you think she would have been sitting in the bed or would she have been moved to a chair? Kind of just spending time in, in moments as much as I can. But in a lot of cases, the scenes that were important to the story weren't necessarily apparent to me when I was doing the interviews. And so I would have to call back and ask for more questions. <laughs> so I have a moment early on in the piece where you know, right at the beginning where one woman in her nursing home bed is listening and, and sort of seeing the, her roommate die. And that scene I built over many phone calls. And then later on in the process, I happened to speak to the nurse who was the one to come in. And so it was a scene that really evolved and, and became a lot richer over time. 
Oh, I can't hear you. Sorry, I muted without realizing it. I said, did it evolve in the writing process or in the reporting process? If it's the sort of that particular scene, I mean, you open with, um, and it, how is that slow dawning of this is the scene I need to develop? How did that mm -hmm. happen? I was, once I'd settled on the characters for this story, I was pretty sure I was gonna open with a death of one of them. And that was for a few different reasons. I mean, in this particular specific case, the death of this one woman had led to this lawsuit, which raised the bigger questions that, that helped to frame the piece. But also I had this feeling two months into the pandemic when I started working on this piece, that I was reading so much and hearing so much about nursing home deaths and this kind of you know, carnage in the nursing home, but I didn't, I had no sense of what it, what it looked like. Um, and the descriptions felt very impersonal. A lot of the coverage of nursing homes in general, and, and particularly at the start of COVID, they don't include interviews with people who live in nursing homes. Um, and so, uh, so in this case, I knew I wanted to build that scene as vividly as I could, but you know, this, this, reporting, I mean, I, I reported the piece out basically as much as I could. I was reporting all the way to the end and adding things. And uh, even when I first wrote, when I first drafted this piece, the nurse who um, was part of that scene hadn't spoken to me at length on the record. And so the scene was shorter and had fewer details than when she agreed to be part of it. So you, I'm hearing two different things about how you landed on your two, the room 10 and the yeah. two women and their mothers. It sounds like at first I thought you interviewed 40 different people and maybe yeah. this one stood out, but then you also mentioned, of course, that Debbie filed the lawsuit. So did, did you know from the get-go that she was going to be a main character or how I, did? Yeah, I didn't know. I knew that this lawsuit had been filed, but I didn't know that it would, it was necessarily going to be the focus of the piece. I also suspected that many more lawsuits were going to come, um, particularly over the course of my reporting. And that was something that I was led to, to believe it, it certainly um, in part because people wouldn't talk to me because they said they were engaged with lawyers. Uh, so I cast a, a very wide net and, um, you know, I was casting in a few different ways. I, I wanted to find someone I wanted to find a reason for retelling the story. You know, what was I adding beyond the New York Times, I think maybe 2,000, 2,500 word piece about the early chaos um, at the Life Care Center. So I was looking for some sort of story that mattered and I was looking um, for people who seemed like, as always, I think it's, it's two things. You're looking for someone who's good and has the good story, but also someone who you feel will go through the process with you, someone who's, inclined naturally to be open, um, someone who doesn't have too many misgivings about sharing the story, someone who's gonna open up their lives and also someone who understands that it's a longer process. I always ask at the beginning, if I have more questions, could we speak again? Because if the answer is no, that it doesn't matter, or if the answer is a hesitation, then the answer, I mean, they're probably not my character. So I actually came up with three alternatives for main characters and brought them to my editor, but I had a strong preference for the two women that I picked. Um, it took me a little while to realize that they were in the same room um, yeah. before I came up with the idea of asking for room numbers. But once I did, uh, I remember sitting down and just writing in my book, you know, blame these two women allowed me to pose the central question of the piece, which is who is to blame? Is anyone to blame? Is it the staff? Is it the nursing home? Is it the county? Is it the state? Is it the system? Is it just the virus? Um, and, uh, and because one of them really pointed the finger at the nursing home and one of them didn't, um, that poses up, that, that came out naturally. Um, and, and, and there was one other thing I, I liked about this particular setup, um, which is that one of the women in the in the room had dementia and it was very important to me early on to get across in some way the experiences of residents who have dementia i feel like that was hugely missing from coverage more than half of people in nursing homes well over half of nursing home residents in the united states have dementia or some other form of cognitive impairment and i was just obsessed with the idea of figuring out 
what, what is it like to experience this chaotic time or at least a chaotic time around you without full cognitive capacity? Um, so eventually, yes, I had the opportunity to have one of the main characters be someone with dementia and, and that was an added benefit. A question from a student, EDP body, is how did you build trust with your character, Helen, um, when she's a woman that's so cautious she wouldn't leave her room? And another question sort of related to that is how did you maintain that trust with both families? Did they know, I mean, they were at odds and had these two different stories and did they know you were talking to both of them? Mm -hmm. I feel like there's sort of two levels yeah. of trust there. Yeah, so in this case, I definitely had to lean a lot on the daughters. Mm -hmm. um, the, the daughters who of course, you know, had previously visited the nursing home, but weren't there. Um, and a lot of the storytelling came through them. Uh, they were both fairly open right away. Although Debbie didn't think she should really be speaking to me because she was involved in a lawsuit, but, but then she also spoke to me. Our first conversation was three hours long. So, um, you know, she did want to tell her story. Uh, I think, you know, we just kind of proceeded slowly. I really don't think I, I came to them with an agenda, certainly to start. I just wanted to know how they felt. And I think they could sense that in my reporting. Eventually they did ask, if, you know, were you speaking to this other person? They didn't really know each other. And I was honest. I didn't offer the information until they asked, but I, I was honest once, um, once they asked and, and I think they understood. Um, so, and they, they spoke of each other sometimes, but certainly the families were, a lot of families were, I mean, in the midst of the most traumatic experience of their lives, uh, a lot of, at this point, even in early May, a lot of them were having trouble being in regular contact with their family members or their family members had cognitive impairment, which made any form of remote virtual conversation basically impossible. And they were really anxious. Um, and so it did require moving slowly. Um, and one conversation often led to the next. So just building on that, a question from another student, Evan Oshner, was, and you touched on it, but I want to push on a little more. You said you really wanted to write about the experience of dementia, but at the same time, you're writing about somebody who's died, a family who's grieving and having dementia. And how did you sort of balance the sensitivity issues of that and your own desire to tell that part yeah. of the story? I think I felt this a bit at the time and it, and it has solidified and strengthened in me since, but I think, um, I think it's really important around when, when someone has dementia and, is, and, I, and I'm talking to them or, or just with family members, just to ask. I think, you know, in most cases, family members have been dealing with a diagnosis of dementia or, or, or patients have been dealing with a di diagnosis for years. This is not necessarily sensitive new ground for them. And in fact, the danger is just not asking because you're sort of nervous. Um, I think, in some cases, I had to sort of negotiate what was possible and appropriate. So for instance, in one case, I spoke to a woman's two daughters several times. Um, uh, I was talking to them with their mother who was in a nursing home and she had, I guess, kind of a mild to moderate dementia, they described it. Um, and I asked if I could speak to her and they said yes, but we just had a different kind of conversation. It was short, it was probably 10, maybe 15 minutes. Um, I wasn't asking her a lot of questions about COVID, but was just kind of asking her to explain her surroundings and how she was feeling. She talked a lot, I remember, about her bed being too close to the window and the sun was making her too hot, um, her foot hurting, and how she hurt it you know, more during the lockdown. And that was useful information. It wasn't like I needed to get those details from her, but I was glad I had asked because, you know, it's her story and, and she was open to telling it. It's a complicated negotiation, I think, and it depends on the status of the person being interviewed. But I think it's a mistake to assume that consent is impossible to obtain ethically and, and so we shouldn't bother. Um, 
I think, you know, talking to the family members openly about that can be useful. Or sometimes, you know, family members, I was able to just give them some information that I wanted and they were able to ask in their own way and kind of report back to me. So I certainly um, used that as well. So I have another question from student Hannah Gonzalez about what was the process like obtaining all the economic information and background and privatizing of the nursing homes? And at what point, or did you always know that that was going to be part of this story? Yeah, I wasn't entirely sure. Um, early on, I started reporting this story at the beginning of September. I mean, sorry, beginning of May, and it was published in August. It was about three and a half months in total, and I worked full time on it. And that was from picking up the phone for the first time to closing the piece. Um, so I knew it would be, you know, kind of a rush. And really early on, I put in some freedom of information requests, made some public records requests, um, just for general things I thought might be useful. I was hoping they would come through quickly. They were very general, but um, because I hadn't, you know, got into the reporting yet, but things like 911, uh, call recordings. Uh, I got emails and phone call notes between the county, Seattle King County and the nursing home. I got some timelines from, um, from the state and from the county. I FOIA'd for uh, no, visit notes from any audit of the life care center conducted by the office of the inspector general of health and human services. So there were things I did right away, the financial records. Um, some I was able to get through freedom of information requests like payroll data, but I got very lucky in this piece and I got connected very early on to a lawyer slash forensic accountant who appears in the piece named Ernest Tosh. And he was so important that I really had to name and, and really explain his role in the piece. Um, but he had, um, it's very complicated, but he built this database to mirror a federal database. And basically what it meant was that he was constantly requesting the financial data from every single nursing home in the country. And so he kind of helped me speed along the process, gave me some of the data that I was still waiting for so I could see it sooner and helped to walk me through it. Um, but that was later on. I didn't know right at the beginning that the finances would be such an important part of the story. And it's very hard to obtain, as I explained in the piece, these kinds of records. Of course, nursing homes get you know, billions of dollars of federal funding, but they're not required to make public any financial statements. And certainly they're not required to make the financial information that they do release readable to the average person. So you had, a, having someone to help explain it to you made a huge difference. Exactly. This yeah. is so complicated that this one guy is hired by other lawyers in the country when they do nursing home cases. It's um, really such a niche um, service that he provides. Um, cool. Wait, yeah. you said you got lucky, but how did you find it? Like, did he literally land in your lap or is this like good reporting made you find him? <laughs> well, um, I'd done some previous reporting on nursing homes yeah. when I was at NBC, which was very helpful because it even, I mean, I, I feel like I had to work hard and I earned, you know, my understanding of what a Medicare Advantage plan is and how it mm -hmm. operates and what Medicaid funds and what Medicare funds and, and what they don't. And so I'd, I had that background that I'd also interviewed some nursing home experts before. Um, of course, nursing home experts were people who prior to COVID were hugely ignored. No one cared about them. They never got interview requests. Now they're extremely in demand media personalities. Um, but uh, I knew some of them and it is kind of a small world and a, quite a divided one actually, in terms of, I think academics who are slightly more sympathetic to industry and, and those who are extremely critical of industry. Uh, but I got to know them all. And one of them said, I was in one interview and I, I always ask who else should I be speaking to? And she said, I met this guy at a conference and he, he's the only one who can pick apart financial statements. And so, um, we got to know each other and he helped me, he helped me with that information because even if I had obtained all the raw data right away on my own, it would have been unreadable to me. It would have come in the form of spreadsheets that 
that only a really specialized accountant could understand. So one of the things that I think is just so well done in your piece is that you get me so caught up in the story of, of this nursing home and these women, and then I, I'm reading along and all of a sudden I'm deeply invested in regulation and finances. And if you had told me I was gonna sit down and read a story about the regulation of nursing home industries, I can't imagine that would have been something I was jumping up and down to do. But by the time I got there, I just couldn't put it down. And this, how uh, it, it's no small feat to craft a story that makes people want to read the policy and the money and the numbers in such a riveting way. And so I'm curious how you think about that back and forth and the balance and how you plan for it. Yeah. So I definitely was not commissioned to write this piece. I was required, I was commissioned to write a shorter piece that got at the question, which I think is was still really core to this article of what it felt like to be living through the experience of a COVID outbreak. Uh -huh. But as I continued with the research, I felt like, I don't wanna say I couldn't have told the story in fewer than 15,000 words, but I really, I really felt like I needed to get into these bigger issues of finances and regulation to understand like the scene that was set when COVID arrived at this nursing home. Um, and so these big structural histories, narratives started, you know, they felt a lot more urgent than I think they, they sometimes do. I hadn't set out to include them, but they felt like they came naturally from this piece. Uh, I spent a long time researching the, the finances of the nursing home industry and the regulation around it. Uh, that was, I didn't know how it would play into structure. And it was fairly late in the process that I had a long talk with my editor and we decided that they should be two separate sections. One looking at just the for-profit industry and its operations, and then one looking at regulation and that the regulation section could come later. And that was both because I think earlier on, we needed to know how nursing homes operate. They're this weird kind of the private usually, but they receive public funds. I thought that needed to come sooner. And then having a section about regulation later, I think my goal was to sort of implicate all of us, implicate us in this system, you know, and look at how we've all signed on to, to these very important institutions being under regulated for so long. But that took more maneuvering. It wasn't in my reporting. I didn't see a clean break between this is the stuff about finances and this is the stuff about regulation. I really had to play up moving things around between those two sections. Um, but I, I tried to ask myself always, is this, you know, how is this impacting people in those beds at the life care center in Kirkland, Washington? Otherwise, that would have been, I think, really easy to get bogged down in even more detail, which I did. I think my first draft was closer to 20,000 words. <laughs> so I have a lot of questions about first drafts and how many revisions, um, but I want to start at a bigger picture level. You mentioned your editor, and I know some writers, they want to get the story and not talk to the editor until the first draft's in. Other editor writers like to work with the editor all along the way. And I want to hear a little bit about what the, what, what, as the writer, what your perception of the editing process was. And if there were any big decisions that the editor made or big footed or what you thought um, was a sort of profound moment in that part of the process. Yeah. Um, so the editor of this piece was Kit Ratchless, um, who I think has edited, who edited in the past, um, you know, a lot of California Sunday's best pieces. I think Kit works differently with different writers, but certainly has a way of being involved throughout the process that doesn't feel overbearing. So um, we spoke fairly regularly, maybe at the beginning, every other week, but then weekly while I was reporting. Uh, and it was really through conversations with him that we allowed in our minds the piece to, to grow. Uh, what was hard with this piece was figuring out what was interesting 
you know, at some point I'm two months into knowing how Medicaid regulates this kind of reimbursement versus Medicare. And I have sort of lost sense of what's interesting or not. So those phone calls were, were really important, but Kit uh, offers, uh, at least has offered me when I've worked with him, um, uh, the opportunity to submit a rough outline before I really start a detailed outline and, and, and draft of the piece so that we can talk through the weight of things and the order of things beforehand, which I took him up on. I thought that was really useful in this case. Uh, and so we were able to put together together the, the, the larger structure of the piece. And then the piece kept growing. And so those were a lot, those were more conversations. I think, you know, Kit, Kit helped me to structure the, the contact sections, the finance and the regulation section, and to see how those fit into the larger piece. Um, he also, um, something that always I, I, I reflect on often, um, he asked me to add a few paragraphs to the end of the piece, which I was very anxious about adding, but which a lot of readers have written to me about. Um, there were a few pieces at the end of the piece where I, a few paragraphs where I reflect more broadly on aging in the United States and um, how we treat the most vulnerable older people uh, and, and the, stru the structures that we've set up. And he really wanted me to write those in my own voice as an authority on the subject. And so I wrote them and then uh, I put them in and then I felt like it was too, it didn't kind of fit with how I saw my role as a journalist. And I begged him to take them out. And that was the one time where he said, you know, you really need these pieces. I think that the, one of the paragraphs started with me talking about the language we were using at the start of COVID. Like it only affects old people. At least it's only the older people and they can stay inside and they're willing to stay inside so that we can go on. And I talked about the idea that we would be haunted by this only, which of course we would only apply to that demographic group. We simply wouldn't have used that language with any other. Um, and so I think that's where he was very useful in, in helping me to make my language more authoritative because I had spent months on this. There were a lot more critics argue and skeptics say and advocates point out before Kit, you know, gave me the confidence to just say what I had learned. I love that idea of the editor as confidence booster. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Uh, that's, that's a nice uh, way of putting it. We have a question in the Q&A from uh, student Natalie Albert, and she says, can you talk about your writing system for this piece? Do you use storyboards? You said you did an outline. I'd love to know if you outline regularly, because I tell all my students to do that. And she says, are there writing filing apps or tools that you cannot live without now that you use them? Yeah. I always start an outline just with free writing. Um, so I'll step away from my laptop and take out a pen and paper and just write what I remember as being really important. It's a critical step for me because otherwise I get lost in details or a thesis and I'm forgetting the moments and, uh, and facts that, that like sink in at a more emotional level. At a very practical level, I use Scrivener. I don't know if your students are familiar with that software. It's um, a lot of writers use it. I know a lot of Times reporters use it and they told me about it years ago. I've used it for years and it's kind of a spruced up Microsoft Word, but it allows you to keep audio files and visual files in organized ways. and over the years of using it, I think it's like $30 or something. Um, over the years of using it, I've developed my own system, which really uh, means that I could go back to a project I did five years ago and it would all be in just this one file and I wouldn't know how to navigate it because I have my system, <laughs> interviews being here and audio being here and, and whatever it is. So that helped me a lot, but I don't, I rarely use um, like, poster cards or anything like that. Um, it's, it's more just writing things out, but I will, I outline a lot. I spend a lot of time outlining compared to writing, I think. So how different was your final story from your first outline? 
The overall structure was similar. What was hard about this piece, I realized as I came to write it, was I was really committed to telling the story from the perspective of residents. However, they had all been in their rooms <laughs> with the doors open or closed. So there was no single resident that could bring me through the whole story because no one had witnessed everything. And so I had to build up my little cast of characters a little bit more and have some more sort of montage scenes. Um, in the first draft of the piece, I didn't have a nurse or, or a staff person as a main character. I had appearances from a few people who had agreed to speak to me, but after the first draft, it became clear that I needed someone who was moving around the nursing home and seeing different things. And that realization corresponded with um, the nurse Chelsea Ernest being willing to, to speak more with me on the record. Uh, so that, that was the main change between first and second draft as she was more of a character in the piece. Had you, was that actually, I think that's really interesting because I think sometimes we think we do all our reporting and then we sit down and write, but it sounds yeah. like you wrote it and then went out and realized you needed this other character or was it a little bit of both? It was both and also she became available. It was very, very hard to connect with people. By the time I started the story, the nursing home was being sued and really, and also they were busy. Um, and you know, if someone says they're busy, I'm usually not very sympathetic, but I was sympathetic in this case because they had residents dying and they're a beleaguered nursing home, but they were very unhelpful at the beginning. Um, the spokesperson, the kind of crisis PR expert who the nursing home had hired to handle media requests put me off for kind of months, would promise an interview and then not ended up calling me one night in the, it, in the evening. He was driving home. It was a long drive and he basically monologued in something close to rage for an hour and a half and then promised me all sorts of documents and follow-up phone calls and never called again. So uh, at the uh, near the end, the nursing home made one administrator available uh, but largely, no, I hadn't, I wasn't able to get anything through them until, until quite close to the end. Staff members also were very nervous to speak. They were still working at the nursing home and they were worried about repercussions. They were worried about violating HIPAA and, you know, patient confidentiality laws. So uh, I had to work very hard to find staff members to speak even off the record. And that was partly you know, I'd ask, I'd ask family members whether they remember the name, the first and last names of any nurses. And I try to contact them. I uh, scoured Facebook pages. At one point I was on like the Life Care Center Kirkland Facebook page. And I would look at photos from like a year before and see who had liked them. And then see if any of them said on Facebook that they were certified nursing assistants. And if they did, I'd write some note and be like, do you happen to work at the life care center? And are you a certified nursing assistant? So um, how often did that, that gener did that generate an actual source or two? Or I think I, yeah, I think in the end I had four interviews with people who were working like the, the life care staff at the time. And uh, yeah, a couple of them came through that and, and they didn't know that the others were speaking to me. So it was very private, but Chelsea was the one nurse uh, level worker who was willing to speak on the record with her name and she was still working for the company. So I think it was a brave decision, but she felt like, and she, she, but she, she, she took a long time to agree. And I think by the time we did speak, which was towards the end of my reporting process, she felt like a narrative had been built that painted the life care center as this terrible facility, the staff members as negligent. And it was that that really inspired her to talk because she felt like it was untrue. And if she was silent, then people would just think she was a terrible nurse who had let people die. So um, yeah. We so I'm really together. struck by how much not only was your reporting going on while you're building the story, but the story itself was really changing, like at the breakneck speed of a pandemic and everything else. And you're so Scrivener is what allowed you to keep track of all these pieces. <laughs> I <Or> do. <laughs> it, it, it helped a lot. That's the software I use, but it's not too complicated. Like mm -hmm. I have friends who use ones that 
like, I don't know, it has AI or something and it comes, it recognizes keywords and it suggests academic articles and it takes six months to get to, to know and to master. And I don't, <laughs> I don't do that, but I do. Um, I do use Scrivener and I do obsessively keep timelines of events um, right from the beginning, which helps me keep track of things. So, well, wait, explain that a little. What do you yeah. mean? Like you were building for every character you talked to, you were building timelines? I or? had a master timeline. Uh -huh. <laughs> they were color coded, but I'd uh -huh. have major events. So, you know, I spent the first few days of the story just really watching and reading everything from local news that I could. And so I'd have all those events in and I'd be able to say, you know, life care, you know, shuts down or first, first staff member becomes infected. But then I'll add smaller things, you know, like uh, Twyla has a fever, um, 2 p.m. And so I keep those because otherwise I lose track of, of things as I go, especially yeah. with a story like this. That, that's actually a great tip. Um, I just want to point out Professor Mayling Hawker just put in the uh, Q&A that Scrivener is discounted for students and faculty okay. folks. Great. So I have another just question. I, um, people, please throw questions in the Q&A if you have them. But I know from experience that even a 5,000 word story that you work with for a month is you're going, it takes like you're memorizing, you feel like you have it practically memorized by the end. And so three and a half months, 15,000 words. I'm curious if you have, how do you stay motivated and engaged in your own story? If you have tricks yeah. that allow you to do that or? I will say that, you know, I hope that people are forgiving with themselves. I found the process very challenging. Um, uh -huh. I actually had so lost sight of whether this piece was good or not that I told my partner on the night I handed it in that I thought they would probably kill it because they would find it unworkable. Um, and, you know, I had to wait the agonizing day for my editor to read it and phone me and say, it's not as bad as you think it is, <laughs> which were his exact words. But, um, uh, you know, I think, I think occasionally, again, the kind of free writing helps me a lot if I do it periodically, because um, I can be reminded of why I find a story interesting. Inevitably, at the end, I, I'll forget or I'll, it will lose the kind of emotional potency. So if I have written down why I care about something, that's, um, that's very helpful. Uh, but this Wait, just describe free writing a little bit more. Like, I mean, you have the story that you've got, you know, officially in all your places and then you're handwriting things on the side or just, you know. Yeah, I keep like many, <laughs> I probably had a few notebooks for this. So I'm uh -huh. jotting down notes, but also just if a moment really jumps out at me or a question that I, genuinely want the answer to, you know, two months later, I'm going to have the answer and be bored by it. So just remembering at the beginning with the kind of fresh eye um, to, on the subject, what, what I found interesting, I think is really important. Uh, and talking, you know, with, with my editor is also useful there, but this was a much more immersive experience than any other piece. Also because I was, you know, we were all in lockdown at the, for the first right. time. And this was, you know, I think still the time where I was probably like using Windex on my <laughs> fruits and vegetables or something. But um, uh, so it was, it was really quite all encompassing that this piece, I really worked on it full time for those three and a half months. I wasn't doing anything else. It made the fact checking a lot more fluid than normal because I just I knew everything I knew the papers where things had been published and the various federal regulations that I was referring to but um yeah I think I think one other tip I would have is um I do try to read a range of sources to understand perspective of my characters so um around this time I I was reading a few there aren't that many, but by definition, there aren't that many memoirs written by people who have dementia, but there are a few um, written by people in the early stages of the disease um, and some good ones written by caregivers. So I was reading some of those. I was reading um, the poet, the, uh, Donald Hall has a few essay collections about aging, one about his eighties and one about being 90. And I read those as just, um, to kind of keep me interested in the subject, but also to just give me ideas and perspectives because I'm not 
you know, in my eighties or nineties myself. And uh, so I think fiction and poetry and essay collections can help too. That's a lovely tip. As, as we, I guess, move into probably the final question, I'm looking at the Q and A. Um, uh, this would be a great, you know, how, what would you suggest in terms of a starting place for students to learn the steps of reporting, writing and investigating from documents and, you know, almost a, you know, okay, journalism students, so, so you, you too want to do an immersive document rich uh, narrative uh, piece, where would you tell people to start? Yeah, I think it, um, I think uh, a lot of it comes through practice because there's no one boot camp or seminar you can go to that will tell you how to get every kind of information. With this piece, there was so much I had to learn about what records were available to me, who could I get them from. Um, uh, and often I had to make calls to public records departments. You know, there are always numbers for say the state or county agencies and just ask them. And if they couldn't help me, who could? And I do think there are there are some organizations. I know one started this year. It's called the Gumshoe Collective, and they have some boot camps on freedom of information. There are a lot of templates that people have put online that can help you learn how to write a good uh, records request. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I think just just kind of asking asking lawyers, asking um, asking other journalists how and where they found records is, is really useful. And in a lot of cases, I will email a press office and I'll say, can I have this? <laughs> and they'll tell me, no, I, you have to file for it. This is a, I can't give this to you. And then that's how I learn. And I'll ask them for advice on, on how to do it. So sometimes it's just about asking and people are, are largely helpful. Um, I think for any kind of story that's on a deadline, thinking early on what you might need and what might be accessible to you is really important because these can take a long time to come through. I certainly had records requests that came through months after the piece was published. Uh, but because I filed some really early on, I got some in the nick of time. Do you, um, so this story ran, I think in August and yeah. you, your book just came out. Are mm -hmm. you working on anything exciting now that you can tell us about? Um, I'm working on a few other projects that are related to dementia and to older adults. Um, I didn't mean for this to become my beat for the last couple of years, but I'm happy for it to be my beat. I think, you know, I was telling a uh, an aspiring journalist a student the other day that, you know, writing the story made me realize, I mean, again, by definition, people in their 80s and 90s are not in newsrooms. So media outlets have a lot of work to do, but are working in a lot of cases to make their newsrooms more diverse, to have their staff members covering a diversity of stories. But I think age is kind of an overlooked part of that. Here I was, I'm writing about this industry that gets billions of dollars of public funding every year and is barely regulated and has terrible oversight. It's very exciting before you attach the, the phrase nursing home to it. Um, <laughs> and I think that that kind of loses people, but I think um, you know that that's kind of where I'm focused on recently because I think there's a lot of stories that have come up because of COVID, but that predated COVID around older adults that are underreported. That's a pretty great place to end. Thank you. I mean, thank you for this wonderful piece and thank you for your time. This was um, fantastic and congrats on this award and all the others that you that the piece and the attention is getting. So thank you so much um, and to the metal community for the enormous honor and for hosting me today. <laughs>